one question you, you kind of hinted at it a couple of times in the book. So do you think that aging is programmed because of the way that the methylation moves in such a predictable manner? Yeah. Yeah. I have to say that I do. I mean, I think that there's a real possibility for that. And, you know, you've talked to Josh Middeldorf and of course, mm. Josh Middeldorf is a friend of mine and, and um, you know, he and I have talked about this uh, endlessly. Like he helped us with the uh, Horvath analysis and so forth. Mm. And I do. And I think that, um, that, you know, the Sinclair laboratory work, you know, he was on my podcast and he said, and I quote him in the book, you know, that the age, the, the, the methylome during the aging journey is as extraordinary in the changes as embryogenesis, which, you know, we all know is amazing. You know, obviously the, you know, methylation patterns are determining, determining the fate of the pluripotent stem cells. And I mean, there's all sorts of extraordinary activity happening in embryogenesis. And he drew the corollary that it's as potent as aging. And, you know, when I was writing the book and kind of paying attention to the different life phases, you do, you, you th that begins to emerge. And of course, just the extraordinary ability to predict biological age as, you know, in the early, in the early Hogarth clock that we used that correlated so tightly or correlate so tightly with chronological age. I mean, you know, you can, you can see that along the aging continuum from it being a negative number in embryogenesis, you know, on up to, uh, you know, three digit numbers in centenarians. It's just, it, it, it seems like there's this predictability of change that would suggest that there's some sort of an evolutionary process in it um anyway yeah. yeah that's where i'm that's where i'm landing how about you let me turn the let me turn the microphone back on you what's your thought <laughs> so uh, i kind of agree with you that uh it just seems to mechanical the, the clock i mean it seems to keep moving beyond so so the the alternative is um, antagonistic kind of pleiotropy seems to be like the other one, which is you get to reproduction and then after reproduction, right. things just go wrong randomly. Well, it, it, wouldn't right. be, it wouldn't be randomly, but it would be the same things break. We don't really, yes, right. Um, but right. it doesn't seem that. It seems that the, the epigenetic changes keep happening, like the, yes. the, uh, the oncogenes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're going exactly like, yeah, why are the oncogenes turned on? You know, why are tumor suppressive genes shut off? Why are pro-inflammatory genes shut off? And it's and you know, it doesn't matter health status. And I I'm thinking about the animal studies, you know, in particular, you know, and looking at changes in stem cells. You I mean our stem cells become damaged, healthy or not, you know, and 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 you can specifically see that at the at the methylone. And it's 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 disturbing and but it also seems predictable i mean and when you look at you know the methylome of a younger person versus an older person it's like the equal and opposite you know as you were alluding to so you know gene bodies start to be turned on as we age whereas promoter regions start to be methylated and shut off and you know that is exactly the opposite so right um i think there is some programming it appears like you know programming could be um a logical possibility. And it's exciting because we can get in there and sort of massage it. And I, I have no illusion that, you know, a diet and lifestyle intervention is going to take us to be the first, you know, 150 year old plus human. Um, but we can at least move within the plasticity, you know, of our programmed, uh, age possibility and air towards the side of, you know, healthy longevity, I think it's going to take a more aggressive intervention to sort of pop us out of that. Right. Which is, I guess, one of the points is that um, really the, the, the program is about extending health span, right? I mean, that is kind of yes. the end outcome. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And well, I mean, I think living well to, to, to your, you know, highest possibility, you know, within this structure, you know, living, yeah, so good, you know, long, vibrant health and life. So when you're, when you're changing these, 
so you, your DNA, maybe you'll have like a DNA that would uh, encourage you to, towards cancer or encourage you towards some other issue. So by playing around with the methylation, can we kind of improve that or impact it? I think so. Yeah, and hopefully that will be our next our next publication looking at our current data set. Um, I was very drawn to the mostly in vitro research looking at just that. Why, you know, the the, the fact that you know these beautiful polyphenols that we know and love, um, you know, green tea and curcumin, resveratrol, you know, diendylmethane, sulforaphane, uh, luteolin, etc. And there's actually a table in the book that people can look at where I, you know, list the various tumor suppressor genes and the polyphenols that have been shown to favorably influence them. So yeah, as I I think I talked about last time, the tumor microenvironment, uh, the cancer microenvironment hijacks gene expression, hijacks epigenetics and shuts down tumor suppressor genes classically in cancer and in aging, like that's a shared phenomena. It's a disturbing shared phenomena. Um, so can these polyphenols help turn, turn genes back on? So in vitro and some animal data suggest yes. And I think that our study, um, you know, may demonstrate that as well. That's the next level in, in investigation. We can see for sure that we turned, I still have to write this up, but uh, there is more promote, we turned promoter uh, regions on, like we reduce the methylation burden in promoter regions in our study subjects as compared to our control. So we need to explore. And I know that some of those genes were tumor suppressor genes, but we need to look a little bit further and, 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 and really tease it out and then write about it. So I, I think that's very, I just think it's really exciting. You do mention that uh, it is possible for epigenetics to be uh, inherited, right? And yeah. so my understanding was, although I, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but, but that, um, you know, when the gametes get formed and then, you know, at, at the beginning of the Scrubbed embryo, me. yeah, everything gets wiped pretty much. Um, so is that not correct? I don't think that that's correct. I think that there are plenty of studies out there to suggest otherwise or demonstrate otherwise, especially in animal models. Um, but I do, you know, I did interestingly enough, read a Guardian article not too long ago that held your position, you know, really strongly and was like anybody who thinks that there's, you know, a heritability component in epigenetic patterning is kind of bunk. And um, I, th- I, th- I think there's sufficient evidence to demonstrate otherwise, Richard. And I just, I just want to point to, you and I were talking about this earlier, There's a, there was a, one of my favorite studies showing this comes from Nature Neuroscience, and it was out of Emory University, Diaz and Ressler. Parental olfactory experience influences behavior and neural structure in subsequent generations. And it's such an interesting study. And it was published, you know, a while ago, back in 2014. So this is nothing new. And I, and I want to say there's plenty of other studies, and there's, you know, mostly in animals, um, you know, you can look at rodents, but you can look at worms. Uh, and then there are some in humans. And I do talk about that in the book. So I, I, I go through this in the book and I, I think I got this paper in there because it, it's just one of my favorites. So basically what they did in generation zero, they clamped the tails of the mice and concurrently gave, you know, exposed them to a bad odor and then isolated offspring for generations to come. So no exposure to this first generation. And all of them, generations out, continued to have the same reaction to this odor, uh, you know, without the tail clamp. And, and I, but what's extraordinary is when they, when they dissected the, the mice, that the whole, that the olfactory region, the olfactory neurons changed. You know, they were that, that particular region that light lit up in response to the odor had physically changed. I mean, is that, and that's, his, that's, that's Lamarck right there, isn't it? So I, I mean, there, there's a physical characteristic, a measurable change to physical characteristics to offspring, you know, almost in, you know, in the immediate and subsequent generations, you know, through the duration of the study. It's just a fascinating paper. I'll send it over to you and then you can just post, post it. But um, 
you know, we can look at the agouti. So the very famous agouti mice um, mm-hmm. from Journal and Waterland. Also, you know, generational influence. And um, this is carried in specifically in their study. They're looking at, uh, you know, the agouti mouse methylation status. And they had, you know, long-term influence on that. So it, it should be back on, right? And they should, subsequent generations should be, you know, blonde and obese. They shouldn't have any methylation happening, but in fact, they do. Okay, interesting. Yeah, now that was... And there's more, and there's more, and there's more in the book, and you can look at, you know, actually, you can look at the, the I talk about the human um, changes a little bit. It's written for the lay person, so it's not as, as in-depth, but it'll give you kind of a taste of it, and, you know, you can do your own exploration, like in the Overcalix study, Overcalix cohort, and, and the um, Dutch hunger winter cohort, and of course, um, the Holocaust has, uh, you know, there's been a lot of study on epigenetic and epigenetics and offspring in the Holocaust. Mm 